Writing one's memoirs is considered the thing to do these days. It's a practice not only popular, but often extremely profitable. And many a man in our generation would prefer to be judged by his memoirs rather than by the facts. I can think of some ancient kings that would very much like to be judged by the flattering inscriptions they left on walls that are now crumbling. Being your own judge, it's a nice trick if you can make it work, but can you and would you really want to? It is written. This is George Vandeman. Today It Is Written presents a different kind of judge. It happened in court one day. The defense lawyer was disturbed by the fact that there was always a pitcher of water on the prosecution's table, but never on the table for the defense. It was unjust. It was unfair. So one day he had, he'd had enough. He addressed the judge and asked that a pitcher of water be placed in front of the defense. But his motion was denied. So he asked that if he might bring his own pitcher of water. Motion denied. He wanted to know why. Because, the judge told him, the defendant might be tempted to throw water at the judge. Well, the lawyer asked if this had ever happened, if water had ever been hurled at the judicial presence. And the judge replied, no, because there's never been a pitcher of water to throw. Well, undoubtedly, there are defendants who would like to do just that. Judges aren't perfect. Judges are human. Judges have prejudices just like everyone else. But judges are taking to themselves greater and greater power over the lives of men. The U.S. News and World Report recently featured an article about the power of our judges and asked the question, are they going too far? It says that with increasing boldness, judges in the United States are intervening more and more in social and political affairs once thought to be none of their business. It points out that judges have vacated and filled seats on school boards and canceled school elections and set school tax rates and told educators how they must or must not discipline students. They've shut down jails. They've issued detailed orders to administrators of hospitals and penal institutions, telling them just how they must do their jobs. And they've gagged the press in many cases, so the magazine reports. Federal, state, and local officers have been overruled by judges on such things as the best route for a highway, the most suitable site for a power plant, or perhaps even the fairest boundaries for a voting district. Yes, judges have power. And when power is used wisely, it may be all right. But power is no better, no safer, than the man who uses it, wouldn't you say? You see, every criminal trial has some very critical moments. The moment when a surprise witness is brought in. The moment when the defendant personally takes the stand. The moment when the jury is obviously swayed one way or another. And of course, the moment when the jurors file back into the courtroom and nobody knows what verdict they bring. Even then, if the verdict is guilty, all is not over. There's still the moment when the defendant waits breathlessly for the sentence to be pronounced. And that sentence all depends upon the judge, a judge who is human, a judge who may have indicated long ago by his statements by his motions granted or his motions denied, by the evidence he admitted or the evidence he barred, that he had no sympathy for the defendant. And yet no man has anything to say about who his judge shall be. A man may choose his own attorney. If he and his family or his friends can afford it, he can choose the highest paid defense lawyer in the land. Or occasionally, a man might win his own case in court if he's clever enough and has both the resources and the know-how. Recently, a defendant, believe it or not, 
produced a videotape worth $7,000 and presented it in court to show why he didn't deserve a $17 traffic fine. Imagine. But what about the man or the woman who doesn't have resources like that? Only recently I read of a tearful father in Yonkers, New York, who said bitterly, you can't trust a boy's life to a computer. His son had hanged himself in jail the night before, where he'd been sent because of a computer error or because somebody failed to check the computer. Personally, I'm glad that when the day of final verdict rolls around, my destiny won't be decided by a computer. And best of all, there'll be a different kind of attorney and a different kind of judge. You see, every one of us has an appointment in heaven's court. Your name's on the docket. It's there. You can't erase it. Tells us so over here in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, and the tenth verse. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Oh, that means everyone, including you and me. And in that court, there'll be no challenges, no legal tricks, no mistakes, and no appeals. Fortunately, you say, that's a long way off, Pastor Vanderman. That's way down at the end of time. Listen. What if I should tell you that God's court is in session right now? Right now. That the judgment is now in progress, even as we talk together today. Did I make a mistake? Did I misspeak just then? <laughs> no. Let me read you one of the most startling statements in all of this book. Over here in the 14th chapter of Revelation, verse 7. Words too clear to be misunderstood, listen to every one of them. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, listen, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come, is come. The hour of his judgment is come. That little word is can be very disturbing at times because it doesn't mean some other time. It means right now. Now, the words I have just read are part of God's last call to men. It says that the hour of God's judgment is come. It's happening right now. There isn't time to go into it today, but a careful study of the Time prophecy given in the eighth chapter of the book of Daniel, verse 14, will lead you straight to the year 1844 as the time when God's judgment would begin. In that year, 1844, God's last call to men began to be heard. From that year on, it could be truthfully said that the hour of God's judgment is come. God wants every man to know. He doesn't want anyone taken by surprise. But you say, how can it be? God's court session in right now, in, in session right now? I know. You thought the judgment would come at the end of time. Most people do. But if you think it through, that would hardly be logical. When Jesus comes back, you see, there'll be a great separation. Some will be taken with him. Some will be left. Some will be saved and some will be lost. Now, how could the separation be made if the guilt or innocence of every man, woman, and child had not already been determined? Interesting? Surprising thought? Perhaps so, but it's logical. And it's right here in the book. Over here in the 11th chapter, 11th chapter of Revelation and the 19th verse, listen. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come and the time of the dead that they should be judged. See? The time when the nations are angry, the time when the dead are judged, both the same right now. You see, in heaven's court, just as here in our courts, 
The legal proceedings involved in processing a man's case are divided into three distinct phases. First, there is the trial, the trial, the investigation, the hearing of the evidence. And based on that evidence, a verdict is reached. The defendant is found either guilty or not guilty. And then, it may take weeks or months, the time comes for the sentencing, the sentencing. That's the second phase of every court trial, both here and in heaven. Then, still later, comes the carrying out of the sentence, the carrying out of the sentence, the execution of the sentence, putting it into effect. That's the third and final phase. Now, do you see it's the trial, it's the trial, the investigation that is happening now? Yes, there's a judgment down at the last day, but that's the executive phase of the judgment, the carrying out of the sentence. Listen, friend, did you know that the prophet Daniel gives us a word picture that, that, of the judgment that is now in session? Listen, this is something that every one of us should spend very serious time discussing. Daniel 7, verses 9 to 13. Here's the picture. I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days, that's God the Father, took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads standing before him. The court set, and the books were opened. Now notice, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. Oh, friend, picture this. There is God the Father on that eternal throne, magnificent beyond description. There are the angels, millions and millions and millions of them, witnesses to every act. And there is Christ to plead our case, the Son of Man. But where are we? Why aren't we there? Doesn't the one to be tried have a right to be there to answer the charges? No, we're not there. What could we do if we were? except to plead guilty to every charge. But we have an attorney there, a different kind of attorney, an attorney who loved us enough to die for us. Could there be a better arrangement than that? How are we judged then if we aren't there? Did you notice it said that the books were opened? We're judged out of the books. Also in Revelation, the 20th chapter, in the 12th verse, it says that we're judged by the information in the books. God has it all there. Your whole life, my whole life, in one giant deposition that is admitted as evidence in court. Every good thing, every bad thing, every conversation, every embarrassing thing is all there. Over here, the wise man said it so well. In Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14, for every for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Mm -hmm. It's all there. It'll come up in court, but there'll be forgiveness too if we're willing to accept it. And it's the forgiveness that counts in that day. Our oh, friends, shall we picture what happened as this court session began back in the last century? God the Father is seated upon his eternal throne. The angels are in their places, and the Lord Jesus Christ, in all of his attractiveness, stands ready to represent the race that he died to redeem. Think of it. Like any court, here are a judge, witnesses, and the law by which the accused are to be judged, but what other court as an attorney with wounded hands ready to plead his own blood for those he represents? Oh, friend, watch that court in session. See how it works. The scriptures give us the magnificent picture of it all. 
The first name to be considered is undoubtedly that of Abel. He was the first loyal follower of God to die. As page after page is read from his record, failure and weakness and sin appear, of course, but there's also a record of forgiveness, and that's what counts in that day. Abel's last act, you may remember, was an act of obedience, an act of true worship. Conscious of his own need, he offered an innocent lamb. And in doing this, he looked forward to the day when the innocent Son of God would die in his place. Now his name comes before heaven's court. And the Son of God, whom he had acknowledged, will acknowledge him. Jesus steps in between the broken law and God the Father, and he holds out his hands and he says, My blood, Father, my blood. Abel accepted my sacrifice, and it, it's, uh, my sacrifice pays his sin debt. And all heaven rings out, keep his name on, and his name is kept on the book of life. The tribunal makes progress through the years. David's name is brought into the judgment scene. Now what will happen? David, as you know, wasn't always what we call a saint. David was a man of blood. Again and again in, in his record, scarlet sin appears. But David, with all of his humanity, with all of his weakness, was a great man, great enough to acknowledge his guilt, humble enough to know that he needed a savior. So it's no surprise to see Jesus step forward, hold out his wounded hands and say, my blood, Father, my blood. I died for sinners like David. He accepted that death in place of his own, and David's name is kept in the book. Then the names of the generations pass until the name of Judas appears. His was not entirely a wicked life. There were moments when he was drawn to his God, but stubborn pride stood in the way. At last, led on from one weakness to another, Joseph, Judas sold his Lord for 30 pieces of silver, then in desperation went out and hanged himself. Just think, just think of the disappointment of Jesus as all this comes in review. He cannot hold out his wounded hands for Judas. Judas didn't accept them. Jesus can say nothing, and the name of Judas does not appear in the book of life. So on down through the years until the cases of all the dead have been reviewed. And then the investigation moves on to the living. Now, when that will take place or when it did take place, we do not know. There's no signal, no alarm bell, no cosmic siren. I only know it's very late. It may be that at this very moment your case or mine is being reviewed and decided. And then... When the last name has been considered, when the case of the last soul is decided for eternity, that fateful decree goes forth, the one you find in the last chapter of Revelation, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly. See, every case decided, human probation ended, never another chance. What a fateful hour. But thank God it hasn't happened yet. Thank God there's still time at this moment to place your case securely in the Savior's hands. Oh, friend. Let me commend to you the Lord Jesus Christ as the most able and efficient advocate. You see, attorneys have their specialties. Some excel in patent cases, some in insurance, and some in criminal cases. Ah, oh, Christ can do many things. Christ can do many things, but his specialty seems to be to take the case of the worst sinner and plead it before God and get eternal acquittal. But you ask, what plea can Christ make for me? I'm guilty. I'm guilty. Why, well, yes, it would be inappropriate for him to plead our innocence, for we're all guilty. There can be no excuse, no alibi, for the Lord found us in our sins, in the very place of our wrongdoing. 
He cannot plead insanity, urge that we're irresponsible on that account, for we sinned against light, against knowledge, against our own conscience. But you ask, what plea then can he make? Our Lord Jesus Christ, with your consent, will stand between a badly broken law and the great God of the universe and hold out his nail-pierced hands and plead the reddest blood this world has ever known. As a brand, brand plucked from the burning, he saves every man that's willing and pleads his case because you've asked him to. But listen, there isn't much time. You see, when the last case has been decided, when every man's destiny has been settled forever, when not another soul can be saved even by the blood of Jesus, heaven's court will adjourn. Its work will be finished. Jesus will step out from the sacred place where he has defended with his own blood every man willing to be defended. No longer will he be our advocate, our attorney, he will now be our judge. And as our judge, he'll descend the blazing skies past constellations of unnumbered universe systems back to a planet that spat upon him and denied him, but one that he could not forget. He's coming back to separate on this planet those who wanted to be saved from those who chose to be lost. The great separation, you see. A different kind of judge. A judge with scars in his hands. A judge who knows what it's like to live like a man. A judge with incredible passion, with no prejudices. A judge who wanted to save everybody and gave his own lifeblood to make it possible. But a judge who finally, with breaking heart, must sentence many a man he tried desperately to save. Could anyone say his judgment is unfair? Oh, no. There couldn't be a kinder, more compassionate judge. If we give him a chance to save us, he will. But his decisions are determined by our choices. There can be no other way. The big question in the judgment is, what have I done with Jesus? What have you done with the man who died for you? You see, before we're ready to meet the Lord Jesus Christ as our judge, we must know him first as our Savior. Before his sacrifice can save us, we must accept it. How else could it be? Oh, the high crime against heaven will not be murder. It will not be any sin for which we place men behind bars. The high crime against heaven, the sin that costs us eternal life, will be to finally reject a love that went to the limit, the incredible limit, to save us. It's the cross of Calvary that'll condemn every man who is lost. But it need not be that way. Our Lord Jesus Christ, with your consent, will save it for God and a broken law. Look at these wounds in my hands. Because I died in his place, I claim his release from death. Let him go free. That's what he wants to say for you. And all he needs is your consent. Give it, won't you, while we pray. Lord, what can we do but accept that wonderful provision? How can we continue to cruelly judge and condemn others about whom we know so little and neglect the different kind of judge who so patiently waits for us to let him handle our cases? Thank you for the plea that you're willing to make for us. Today we let nothing keep us from fully and completely placing our cases in your hands, your able, saving hands. It's in your name that we ask it and make this commitment. Amen. Well, we've talked about some very vital things today, haven't we? Would you like to know more? Would you like to have the heart of today's message in print so that you can go over it again and again and give it to those who matter to you? 
You'll find it in the book that we're offering today as our gift. It's my book, Destination Life. Now, Destination Life is a book about the future. It's about life after death. It's about the future that God has in mind for us. And of course, when we begin to talk about the future, we touch the whole realm of the psychic world, the whole realm of the occult, because that's the area in which these people operate. And sincere men and women want to know how this checks up and lines up with the Bible. Or if it doesn't, they want to know that too. You see, men and women are tossing balls across the wall into the unseen world, and somebody's tossing them back. The big question is who? And is it safe to play a game with an individual on the other side whose identity you know nothing about? Listen, friend, there's a whole section in this book about psychic phenomena that touches today's subject too. Also, it's about how to tell a real miracle from a counterfeit. It's about how God will finally deal with sin. Will sinners, for instance, burn forever as many of us have been taught? Or does God have a kinder, more loving way in dealing with a rebel world? Destination life. Sound intriguing? Sound important? Yes, it's a book you need. Be sure to ask for your free copy. There's no obligation whatsoever, so don't hesitate. We'll tell you in a moment where to phone or write. Just one thing. Sometimes our viewing friends write in and say, please send me the book. And since we offer quite a number of books, I think you see the problem. So please ask for the name, the book by name, Destination Life, so that we'll know which one to send. And then, of course, the mails are slow these days. Please be patient. It may take several weeks to get there. Now, here is the information you need. You may request Pastor Vandeman's free offer by writing directly to It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. The offer is sent by mail, free and postpaid. Could there be an easier address to remember? Just, it is written, Box O, that's simply Box Zero, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Please be sure to ask for the offer by name. It takes only a few moments to write, but it could mean a lifetime of satisfaction. The address again is, it is written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Please mention the offer by name and write, It is written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. And now the time has come to say goodbye, everyone. But remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God.